In this video, we will discuss the nature of forces. So the first question is, what is a force? So very simply put, force is usually characterized as a push or a pull. So you have an object and you can apply a force on this object that will try to move this object and that could be seen as a push. You could also apply the force in the opposite direction and that may be seen as a pull. Now the next question is, why do we care about the forces? So the forces give rise to two things. One is the motion and the other is deformation. We care about the forces because we want to be able to move something from some place to some place and for that we need to impart a force. So for example, if let's say this object over here initially is at zero velocity and you want to move it from here to here where it has acquired some velocity, let's say five meters per second, then it has clearly undergone some acceleration because the velocity is changing over time and that means there has to be a net force that would give rise to this acceleration. On the other hand, if you take the same object and you apply a downward force on it like this, then it's clear that this object is not going to go anywhere because it's constrained by the ground. So in this case, the possibility is that depending on the properties of the material from which this object is made, there could be a deformation of this object. So we also want to understand if we want to deform something, how much force we need to apply on it so that it will have desired deformation. Or maybe we want to understand the limits of how much force it can, can be applied on this object before it will break or fail in some way. So both motions and deformations are given rise to via application of forces. Now let's come back to our original problem, which was that uh, we want to understand what a force is. So quantitatively speaking, it's okay to say it's a push or pull. But a lot of times if you ask people what a force is, they will give you this as the definition. And everybody knows that this is Newton's second law, which says that the force is defined as mass times acceleration. But this is an erroneous definition. To say that force is defined by mass times acceleration is tantamount to saying that you are defined via a relationship. So for example, you are a son or daughter of your parents. If somebody asks you, what are you? How do you define yourself? You don't define yourself via your relationship with other people. So to say that force is mass times acceleration is really just giving a relationship, not really defining what a force is. So to define force, we need to understand the material interaction between the two objects. So we have to understand material interaction between two objects. And it's a characterization of that material interaction that defines a force. So we will define force as characterization of interaction between two objects. So for example, if you have a block that's resting on a surface, then it's, it has interaction with the Earth's gravitational pull, okay, which is pulling it downward, and it's also interacting with the surface on which it is resting. So if you isolate this and you just draw it all by itself, and we will soon see how we will draw the forces on individual objects using a pictorial or visualization tool called free body diagram, then there are only two forces acting on it. One is the gravity, which is acting downward, and the other is the normal reaction from the ground on the object. So the material interaction of this object with the ground is giving rise to a normal reaction. And the gravitational pull is giving rise to the gravity. So to define the forces, you have to understand something about the interaction. Now the interaction could differ from situation to situation, which means that there will be different definition for the forces. So there is no single universal definition of the forces. 
You could qualitatively say that this is a push or a pull or a characterization of interaction between the two objects, but that does not define exactly what the nature of the force would be. So let's look at some of the common force laws. Force laws. So the first law we will look at is universal gravitational attraction. So this law says that if you have two objects anywhere in the universe, then they're attracting each other. Let's say their masses are M1 and M2, then the force of attraction, let's call it F, and this is mutual force of attraction, is given as G times M1 times M2 over the distance between the two objects. Let's say this R squared where G is the universal gravitational constant. So this is defining a unique interaction between the two celestial objects and that gives rise to this particular definition of the force. Another kind of you know, force which we encounter quite a bit in engineering is friction. And there are two kinds of friction. One is what we call uh, dry friction, dry or we also call it Coulomb friction named after Coulomb, who gave rise to a model for the dry friction. And the other is drag. So drag is usually encountered when you have an object that moves through a fluid medium. Okay, so it could be moving in this direction or it could be moving in the downward direction, it doesn't really matter. But the objects that move through the fluid medium like an aircraft structure uh, or a spacecraft moving through air um, experiences some drag, okay? The other one is the dry friction, which is given rise to when you have an object, a solid object moving over a solid surface, okay? Now the dry friction is interesting because there are different empirical laws to model different situations of dry friction. So for example, if let's say I have an object and this object could be, you know, uh, a heavy a block of something or it could be a book or it could even be a person model being modeled as a particle, okay? So if you apply a force on it, now depending on the weight of this, this block, the object may or may not move. And that would depend on, of course, how much force is being applied. So let's say you apply a very minimal amount of force and the object is not moving. Now, if the object is not moving, then there has to be an opposing force acting on the object. And if I ask you what that force is, you would say, hey, that's friction between the object and the ground over here, right? So. In this case, if the object is not moving, so the case one is object is not moving, then if you draw all the forces acting on this object, so you'll have friction force acting the opposite way, you have the normal reaction from the ground, and you also have its weight. So those are all the forces acting on this object. Then you would say that in this case, F is equal to F sub F, F sub F being the friction force, okay? So as you continue to increase the force applied on this object, while the object is not moving, this will always be true. So if you plot the curve, the, the graph between F and F sub F, you'll find it will be a straight line, right? And this will be a 45 degree angle because F is always equal to F sub F while the object is not moving. But there will come a point when the object will be just in the situation of movement and that case is called impending slip impending impending means about to slip okay so impending slip case is when the object has not yet moved but if you apply just a little bit more force it will actually begin to move in that case the friction force is defined as something called mu s times the normal reaction so mu s is defined as a static coefficient of friction and n is a normal reaction. So now you can imagine that if n is large, and n would be large if the weight is large, because n and n, n, uh, mg would be you know, completely balanced with each other, and mu s would depend on the, the characteristics of the surface between the object and the, and the ground, then the friction force in this case is mu s times n. And this is the largest possible friction force that exists between this object and the ground. Now the third case is when you exceed this force of application, so the F is F increases to the point that it is actually slipping or moving, moving with respect to ground 
or we also call it slipping. Okay, so when that happens, friction force actually comes down a little bit and now it is defined by mu k times n where mu k is defined as kinetic coefficient of friction. So this is called kinetic coefficient of friction. Okay, and this one is called static coefficient of friction. So if I have to complete this graph over here, we get up to this point and now it will become mu sub mu s times n. So this will be mu s times n. That's your f sub uh, s. Okay. And then after that, there will be a drop and that is mu k times n. Okay. So that's what it will be. And of course, of course, what it is moving will always be mu k times n. A third kind of force that we encounter quite a bit uh, in this in this uh, class as well as in other uh, engineering classes is what we call linear elastic forces. So linear elastic forces. So what are linear elastic forces? If you take an object, let's say you know we have a rod, okay, a rod made of some material, it could be made out of some sort of plastic, it could be made out of steel, it doesn't really matter, and you pull it from both directions. So you're applying what we call a tensile force. You're trying to stretch it basically. Now, depending on the material, the object may stretch more or may stretch less, right? You can imagine if this was made out of uh, some sort of soft rubber, you could stretch it quite a bit. If it was made of aluminum or steel, you would not be able to stretch it much, um, but it would still stretch to some extent, right? So linear elastic forces are defined by the law that says that the force of stretch or the tension is actually equal to some constant times the elongation. So if let's say this, the original length of this was L and after a while of applying this force, the length became L plus delta, then the stretch is clearly delta, right? That's the stretch. Then the force law is F equal to K times delta. So if you plot this, you have the F here, you have the delta and you have a line over here, okay? Now, after a while, it probably may, will not be a line. It might uh, become a curve after a while, but we are only interested in up to this region, and that's why we have the word linear over here. Now, most of the time, you will see things like beams and the bars or the plates, even though the stretch will be really modeled as a spring. So they might be seen as something like this, where you are applying you know, forces uh, like that, and as a result, the spring basically stretches. Now, this is the law for the tension, but a similar law actually works for the compression also. So if you take the spring and you apply compressive forces, or you take your bar and you apply your compressive forces, this law is still valid, okay? So in this case, of course, it is still going to deform. Let's say original length was L0, and after deformation, it became L0 minus delta. You can clearly see that the deformation is delta, and the law F equal to K times delta is, is still valid.